On December 26, 2004, a large earthquake off the coast of the Indonesian island of Sumatra caused a tsunami, which devastated the shoreline of at least 10 countries. One of the most affected countries was Sri Lanka, where over 38,000 people died, and tens of thousands more were left homeless. Our story is about the effects and relief efforts in one small area of the southern coast of Sri Lanka, between Tangal and Matara, called Marwela. Formerly known as Ceylon, Sri Lanka is an island nation slightly smaller than the state of South Carolina. In this small tropical country, the nation is about 69% Buddhist, and beautiful Buddhist temples are scattered throughout the cities and jungles. Buddhist monks live in the temples and spend time studying and traveling between the cities and villages. The garment industry accounts for a great portion of the country's livelihood. One example of handcrafted clothing is found in the ancient art of batik. Tea is the largest export crop, followed by rubber and coconuts. And Sri Lanka is known for its fine aromatic tea. Like other Asian countries, the lowlands in the countryside are laced with rice paddies. It's an ancient culture moving forward to meet the modern world. Colombo is the capital a very modern city with all the hustle and bustle of commerce and trade. Education is patterned after the British system. Every day you see the children in their immaculately clean, pressed white uniforms on their way to and from school. Outside the cities, people live in quiet villages. <laughs> What would village life be without a farmer's market? The coastal villages rely on fishing as their principal source of income.
fishermen supply a very important source of protein to the rest of the island. Fishing has been the tradition here since history began. Their life revolves around the sea. Coconut palms, white sand beaches, and a warm inviting ocean make this a paradise which attracts tourists from all over the world. Life by the sea was good. Then one morning, disaster struck. measured 8.9 on the Richter scale and it is the strongest anywhere in the world for 40 years. The epicenter was off the island of Sumatra in northwestern Indonesia but it's caused fatalities in countries from there to India. At least three and a half thousand people died in Sri Lanka with a million more displaced. Elsewhere flash floods have shut the port in the capital Colombo. The country's president has declared a national disaster and appealed for international emergency aid. In the days that followed, the survivors in the Marwella Beach area tended to the injured and buried the dead. Many people were swept out to sea and their bodies never recovered. The local fishing fleet was decimated. Most boats, motors, and nets 
were severely damaged. Only a slab and some rubble remained, where once stood wonderful seaside homes. And the villagers tried to understand what had happened to them. People that lost their homes found shelter in temporary camps, usually tents generously donated by non-governmental organizations or NGOs from all over the world. In the Marwala Beach area, there was an uninhabited apartment building to house some of the displaced villagers. Built by Japanese engineers years before, it's owned by the Ministry of Fisheries in Sri Lanka. This became the temporary home for 95 families. Padmini and her husband Bindu lived in Marwella. <laughs> On that morning I was working in the kitchen and my husband was watching TV with the kids. We heard a loud voice from the beachside and we looked through the window and saw sea waves coming. My husband took our son, and I took our daughter by the hand. While we were getting out the back door, a big wave came through the front door. There was no time, and the wave took us all away. My daughter and I were separated from my husband and son. After that, my daughter was pulled from my hand. We lost everything we had, and we are very poor, but we're sad because our children died. The other things mean nothing to us. My two children were killed by the tsunami. After a couple of hours, we found my son, but not my daughter. My son's age was 12, and my daughter's age was 5. I cannot understand why God gave us that kind of punishment. Many of the families forced to seek refuge in the camp have led a fishing lifestyle for generations. Sisira is the oldest son in a large family of fishermen. I was mending nets at about 8.45 in the morning. It flooded to about 15 feet. And after that, all the water went through the lagoon, back to the sea. All the fishing gear, cooking pots, and everything was destroyed. Because of the tsunami, my two children and wife have many problems. They are sick at the moment. Even if the tsunamis keep coming, the ocean is our livelihood. Before we can go back to the sea, we need help. On behalf of the villagers, I am thanking you for giving me this chance to speak. The camp is situated about 300 meters from the seashore, next to a lagoon. Besides a few small fish, there are large prawns in the lagoon. The camp has no water source. Large water trucks come periodically to fill a big bladder which supplies water to several faucets. The 
Fira's brother and his wife live in the camp, as well as his mother and father. Our elder son, Cicera, saved our lives and our children's lives. In this temporary place, we are extremely helpless. We don't have houses, no jewelry, no furniture, no sewing machines, no income or livelihood anymore. Because he lost these things, he cannot speak anymore. He is sad. What to do? We lost everything. Other displaced villagers received a temporary wooden shack from Sevalanka. Jaya Siri and Dipika managed to save their children, but lost their home and everything in it. I came out of the house and I saw the big wave coming towards us. I ran away with my children through the jungle. There was nothing left. Even our fishing equipment was gone. Our big boat, which was on the beach, was also missing. In the past, we did not ask anything from others, but now we have to beg. I am giving this testimonial to rebuild my house. I thank everybody who is helping us. Usually the temporary wooden houses are clustered, which are camps in their own right. Also living in the wood house camp with her family is Kamudu. My name is Hashani Kamudu Mali. In the morning, my mom gave me two plates of rice and fish, and when I began to eat, some people came and shouted, huge waves are coming, run away. I climbed up a tree with my little sister because we could not go to the road. After a few minutes, the water level came up to my sister's nose, and my mother swam over to us from another tree and carried my little sister to the top of the tree. Actually, our house is close to the beach and we are very afraid to be there because any moment another tsunami might come. Whole fishing villages were destroyed all along the coast in Sri Lanka. The tsunami crashed ashore right at the peak of the European tourism cycle, killing many foreign tourists and severely damaging countless guest houses. Seven kilometers from Marwella Beach, in the town of Tangal, Steve and Verena were setting up a small guest house. We decided that we'd come to Sri Lanka because uh, I was born here. Um, I have still got family here. I have some friends here. We bought a small guest house with a restaurant. Um, we'd spent months doing it up. I was just about to take the dogs for a walk down the beach and I was putting me sandals on in one of the front, beach front rooms. And uh, I heard, heard shouting. I looked across and where the, where the sea and the sky normally meet at the horizon, it was just a wall of, a 30 foot wall of water. And it swept me into the room, uh, knocked the air out of me. Unfortunately, in one of those quakes of faith, I ended up in the roof ceiling, in the void space. and. Um, I managed to get a, a lung full of air, which carried, carried me through the initial shock. At this point, I didn't know where anybody was. Um, Steve, I don't know. The dogs, obviously, were trying to get up higher, but there was nowhere to go. After 20 minutes of being in the biggest washing machine in the world. When, when the second wave withdrew, I found myself hanging onto the gutter and um, doing a maritime superman in 180 degrees. The, the only difference is Superman didn't have his underpants sliding down his legs with the vacuum effect. So I spent a good couple of minutes. A crazy thing to do, but I wanted to maintain my dignity whether they found me alive or dead. My main concern as the waters withdrew and was where was my wife? Um, I feared the worst. And then 
I was despondent, um, believed, all was lost. But I still didn't know when Steve was. But then I heard the shout from him saying, Arena! <laughs> And that was just, I just could not believe it, could not believe it. Because up until then, I actually thought that he was, he was gone. We, uh, we obviously greeted each other with immense enthusiasm, is what I could say. Uh. And then I walk down the corner, and the restaurant that I'm sitting in lies some 15 feet higher than uh, the beach front. And she was standing at the front of the restaurant. I have never known exhilaration like that. Um, I've been through typhoons on ships. And Fires on ships, five years on oil rigs, but I have never known anything like that day. Just west across Tangal Bay lies a Sri Lanka naval training base. The commanding officer is Jagat Mutubandara. A lot of uh, foreign people in the form of uh, non-government organizations, then the philanthropists arrived in the Hambantar area and contributed a lot uh, to the uh, tsunami victims by way of donating uh, food stuff uh, and by donating uh, shelter, uh, giving uh, medical supplies. So uh, I think uh, there is a good progress. One of the largest NGOs operating in Sri Lanka is the German Development Corporation, or GTZ. Dr. Peter Zybert works with his staff from a district headquarters office in Tangal. German Development Corporation has had a project here running for the last seven years. So we start our project with an emergency phase on the second day after the tsunami. And the delivery of the goods needed immediately, like uh, medical care, like uh, dry food, this was provided by the German Development Corporation to different stations. The first phase was the emergency phase, the second phase was the rehabilitation, and from March on we start in a development phase. It means housing schemes. So the development phase we will continue for the next, let's say, one and a half to two years. Located between Tangal Bay and Marwella Beach are the Palm Paradise Cabanas. Dr. Manfred Manicki and his wife Corinne started building this paradise 25 years ago. We delivered all these things uh, here in the area, uh, particularly uh, about 10 or 12 uh, refugee camps. That was the second step, uh, uh, care packets, food, uh, clothing, tents, mosquito nets, and. Uh, things like that, and for, for children, toys, medic medicine, um, for females, uh, certain hygienic uh, items, baby stuff, and so on. Particular now, uh, the second and the third step of uh, tsunami, helping the people to get back on their own feet and live on their own. In, in our case here, to start a, a catamaran project, project that uh, to help the fishermen to go to the sea and to fish. Manfred never laid off a single employee after the tsunami. Raymond Dingle from Australia directed a small NGO called the Marwella Village Relief Fund, or MVRF. With the help of Commander Jagat and his team of naval mechanics, 53 outboard motors were repaired from saltwater immersion in the Marwella area. Two motors were never found, and MVRF replaced them with brand new motors. Here is a boat launching ceremony in early February. An American volunteer, William Prosser, came to work with MVRF. I came to the Marwilla area in Sri Lanka February 1st. Since I had some experience in commercial fishing in California, I was able to help the fishermen repair their boats. 
we made a little boat yard, got fiberglass and resin, and the fishermen reconstructed their boats, laying out the fiberglass over wax on cement in the shape of their boat pieces. Then they simply joined the pieces together. There's no port or harbor in Marwella area, so the fishermen use smaller, lighter craft that they can pull up on the beach and tie up. There's really only two types of boats in that area. There's what we would call a skiff, they call a boto, and there's a catamaran that comes in various sizes. Most of the damaged catamarans needed the outrigger replaced. The fisherman picks out his tree in the jungle, we chop it down, haul it back to the beach, carve it to shape, then it's lashed to the canoe. William conducted a survey for fishing nets, and LTU of Germany generously granted 35,000 euros for the purchase of 73 fishing nets for fishermen in the camp and four villages. The fishermen received vouchers and redeemed them for nets at Lafir Sons in Matara. Piece by piece, slowly but surely, the villagers are putting their lives back together. The men are starting to fish again. After the tsunami, you guys kicked the doors in and moved in. Right now, we've got overflowing sewage because nobody wants to take responsibility. They actually want to try and charge these guys yeah. in the camp yeah. to pump their sewage. So I'm, I'm a little angry about it. But let's go back and see the raw sewage leaking oh, in the lagoon. Okay. <laughs> Here's the guy, lagoon fishing, just below the raw sewage leaking yeah. in. Oh, that's why we're not going to have prawns tonight, Claudia. Yeah, it's nice. That headland, or that point, that far house, where our area goes from that first house there all the way down to this first rocky point right here. And pretty much not up to the road, but all the tsunami affected families right here. It's about 1,400, I think it's 430 families. Lynn Watson is a social worker in the UK. She came as a relief worker. Lynn spent two months going to each individual household in the camp and four villages in the Marwella area to complete a needs assessment survey. All the NGOs working in the district are able to access the data for aid distribution. Lynn, here with Carolyn Osborne, 
also set up art therapy classes for the children. A Buddhist temple near Matara is providing a temporary home for a group of women creating delicate lace work. Basically the ladies are working here doing their lace making because their factory was completely flattened during the tsunami. So the monks have very kindly said they can have a small room upstairs and that's where they're working. when working with such fine and delicate uh, white cottons making uh, this lace. So they need to have white towels about this size to cover their boards. So I guess we better go and find some white towels from somewhere, yeah. <laughs> Beneath the lace workshop, teachers hold Montessori school. Many foreigners came to help as volunteers. Mervyn Church and his daughter Emily sacrificed their vacation time for the relief effort. These are the children of this camp. It's called the Handloom Camp. They all live in this large factory over here, which has been partitioned off inside by a Japanese charity group. We've provided a kitchen with running water and a kitchen sink and gas stoves inside for them to cook with. Until we arrived, they were cooking on wooden fires outside. We supplied the tiles, but the men of the village have done this. We always buy them fruit and vegetables, and we give the, the, the men the money to buy fish. They are all trying to keep their homes clean and tidy. We bought these blackboard and easels, easels for them for the children to, to uh, learn their alphabets with. This, this is the sewing machine. And they are making the school uniforms for this. Uh, this again was donated by Mike. And um, each, each, each of all the families were asked what they needed for their camp. So one, they asked for a sewing machine, they asked for an iron and an ironing board so they could iron the children's uniforms and make them smart for school. Okay. You, no, you want to get the hands clean, don't you? What have you got there? I've got bonbon. Okay. <laughs> Emily is giving out pictures that she's taken everybody that she's had plenty. So everyone has pictures of their children. Um, and hopefully it brings some happiness to you. Until we plumbed this in, there was no washing facilities at all here. Okay, right. Hello. 
The Tangal hospital was severely overtaxed in the wake of the tsunami. I was working as a doctor in Tango District Hospital. When I was working in the hospital that day, and a lot of people came, and most of them uh, did. As a doctor, I think I did my best, but the thing was that the hospital was not in a position uh, to tackle the, this type of problem. Tangal Hospital is undergoing a makeover run by Nick Buckingham from the UK. Um, they brought all the bodies here uh, and sadly were, were, were piled up in the uh, admissions. People were treated on the floor and uh, obviously people did die as a result of that. Many people were sent off to other hospitals 45 minutes to an hour away at least. And uh, many of those people sadly didn't get through. So the idea here is, is, is to have a short, medium and long-term project to renovate and take care of this hospital. I'm not a doctor. Um, I live here in Tangle. I'm constructing a small-scale tourist resort here. Come with me and I'll show you. So I said I'd show you where uh, operations are currently conducted. Now I, I witnessed someone uh, having a minor procedure performed a couple of days ago on this bed here. So uh, this is just how bad it is. So yes, there's burning the hospital waste. There is no incinerator in the hospital, so you know, one of our plans is to put an incinerator. What I'd like to do is to take you off and show you the, the, what a ward looks like, a typical ward looks like in this hospital. And then I'll show you what we've been able to achieve in a couple of weeks. This is where they uh, keep the rubbish bins during the day. Okay, they've just been uh, emptying them and burning them. So this is where they keep them. And this is the ward. I'm going to hold my breath and uh, run in and show you. Okay. These, this is the standard of the toilets throughout the hospital. We, we're going to replace all of them right the way through. All the washing facilities and all the toilets. As I say, the government sees this as their disaster and they want to naturally control it. This is a proud island nation. And they obviously feel um, they want to repair themselves in some way. But I don't believe that any country could withstand the shock of a disaster, uh, manage a disaster of this magnitude without help from outside. We talked before about power problems at the hospital. The electricity, just as I've said that, has come back on again. But we've just had a failure of electricity. So this hospital needs to be able to at least afford to run its own generators. So yeah, this is where they make up the medicine. Um, it's pretty organized here, and they get through a lot of people, a lot, a lot of uh, prescriptions here. But this budget, the, the petty cash budget, for this hospital is only 500 rupees a day. That's five dollars a day. Petty cash for this entire hospital. Okay, there's a nice sign here. So, here we go. As you see, we're cooking on an open fire. Very smoky in here. I don't think this place has ever been cleaned. And this is the chef. He's asked for uh, he's asked for one of our t-shirts, but I told him he couldn't have a t-shirt until he cleaned his kitchen. We think it's time to modernise a little bit. Uh, we're going to rip off the roof and uh, tile the whole thing, stainless steel work counters, uh, and we're going to put um, some gas burners in here. Many of these guys here today, they come and they work hard and they do uh, really nasty and dirty work. The guys up on the roof there, they just put the uh, roof sheet in their pond. There was a time when I couldn't walk into this place and breathe at the same time. This ward was of the same standard that you saw just a moment ago. We've rubbed down all the walls, we've removed all the ceiling fans and lights, we've removed all of the toilets and cleaning and washing facilities, and we've replaced them. We've got the full support of people here. They really do want to make sure that there's a better hospital here for the people of Tangle and Grace.
back in February we started this project to uh, renovate and equip the hospital. Uh, we've been at it four months now. Uh, Will, you've come to me at the end of the day and I'm really tired. Yeah. So this is progress. Um, if you remember outside in the corridor we had a dirty old bed and a, an open bucket and all the um, uh, dressings all over the floor and so on. Well now we have a bucket with a lid. Uh, and we have a nice clean bed and a nice clean mattress and we've created this area where they can do the dressings safely. And note the absence of any flies. But, uh, lighting, mosquito nets, brand new mattresses on the beds, covers. And the renovated beds don't look, uh, don't look half bad really. So the nurses seem to be pretty happy with it. It's much cleaner. Um, things don't fall off the wall anymore. And uh, you can, have you noticed you can breathe in here? Uh, while you're in <laughs> so uh, the smell is gone. Uh, we still need to do a bit of work with the, the, the cleaning staff, but it's infinitely better than it was. Well, when I came in here, it was very difficult to assess, and I thought, well, it's going to be a lick of paint. We'll replace the toilets and the sinks, and and uh, you know, and give the place a bit of a, a bright nut. Having been here, we've seen this is really a reconstruction project <laughs> rather than uh, a renovation project. So I'm quite happy to say, give a year of my life. Uh, I put a year of my life into this hospital and a little more if necessary. Jayasiri and Deepika lay the first symbolic foundation stone in the construction of their new house. An auspicious day and hour, chosen by Buddhist monks, marks the moment a blessed stone is laid beneath the foundation. This is Will. Nice man. Good man. And ready? Not not married, no. And ready. Here we are, Will. There is much work to be done. Many people still need help getting back on their feet. This to me is a very rewarding project. Um, we're all volunteers here. The only people earning any money out of it are the people that are doing the, the physical and dirty work. Um, I'm happy to do that and I think that if anybody gets a chance in their life to do something like this, uh, it will give them something to look back on later in life. This life in Sri Lanka changes you, changes, changes in your attitude. And this changed a bit of my thinking also through all the time. Compare it with Afghanistan, compare it with North Korea, compare it with Mongolia, it's a very, very big change. 
See, at the moment my paradise is in Sri Lanka.